to kick off the, the discussion, um, we've gathered some questions even before you know, we had this, the sessions here, so perhaps you could look at the, the dynamics of Euroscepticism, uh, if we are witnessing a, a peak of Euroscepticism, or if it's only the beginning of a more fundamental illiberal process. Uh, we could also perhaps look at ways to, to fight Euroscepticism, or should you know, pro-Europeans stand for the EU as it is, or take into account the fears and concerns that fuel Euroscepticism? And also, very much following up on what Olivier was saying, it would be interesting to look at the links between uh, populism, nationalism in other countries, and populist Euroscepticism uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. So that's my way to kick up the discussion. Now for uh, the questions coming from the, the audience here, perhaps you could uh, state your name uh, and your institutional affiliation, and if you address your question to a specific member of the, the panel or to the panel as a whole, and of course panelists can ask questions uh, you know, uh, from one another, obviously. So uh, I don't know who wants to, to, to start here. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Sasha Garbin, a professor in the Law Department of the College of Europe. Um, I have a specific question uh, to Bridget and a general question for the entire panel. Um, Bridget, thank you very much for that very thought-provoking presentation. I was very intrigued by your identification of negative integration, uh, negative integration, um, and I was wondering whether you could elaborate a little bit on that. Specifically, what types of negative integration do you mean? Are you referring to the case law of the Court of Justice? Are you referring to country-specific recommendations, and so on? And in that respect, I um, would question how that relates to your finding in your model that the Euro that Europe's consensus-driven mode of decision-making, I think, in, in legislation, um, makes it an easy target for populism, um, because I find that intuitively a little bit difficult to understand how such great majorities would then open it up for, for populist attacks, and specifically also because, as we saw from Hans Peter's uh, presentation, um, it's the, the main drivers for, for populist challenge seem to be the Euro crisis and migration. And those two areas are not so governed by the community method, by legislation, by rules. Um, so it's in fact, I think, a lack of, uh, of, of consensus-driven decision-making that leads to a, a legitimacy deficit in those areas which might tie into the populist challenge thereof. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And then for the whole panel, if I may. Um, so, of course, the normative assumption that underlies all of our discussions is that populism is bad, and I agree. Um, but I'm not sure we've really analyzed why. Um, is it because it's anti-democratic? Is it because it's a nationalist? Is it because it's socialist? So is it on substance? Or is it about methods? I mean, Olivier, you said it's, it's anti-scientific, it's, it's emotional. But are all of these things so different categorically from mainstream politics? Um, I'm not sure. Instead, what I ha why I think populism is bad and uh, why it's different from mainstream politics, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer, is because of its rejection of constitutional democracy. And so I think that's where mainstream political parties are in a way confined in their hypocrisy and their, um, and their opportunism um, by the fact that they're still ideologically and deontologically tied somehow for, to respect for constitutional democracy. And this is where the populists, I think, differ. So they reject constitutionalism outright, so that's clear. But also they have a very tense relationship to democracy because they deploy the various types and definitions of democracy for their own purpose and they're entirely opportunistic about it. And I think why we're afraid of populism is because we feel that they're authoritarianists and they will dispose of constitutional democracy the moment they get in power. So what are your thoughts on, on that? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Well, firstly, beginning with negative integration, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't include the case law of the Court of Justice as negative integration. That's simply the judicial arm of the polity. What I mean by negative integration are, is the way in which the EU limits the available scope of domestic policy through its competition law, public procurement law, and on and on. In other words, EU legislation does a number of different things, but one of the things it does is narrow uh, the available terrain of domestic policy. Thou shalt not. Finance ministries <laughs> like thou shalt not. They're very happy to be told because they use this in their domestic bargaining uh, with other ministries, but that's not necessarily the case across the governmental system. So I specifically mean it in terms of the range of public policy at domestic level, nothing to do uh, with the court. On the consensus, the point I make there is that uh, populism tends to, is anti-system. It challenges the system. And the EU is a very centrist project. It's a project that requires cross centre-left, centre-right coalitions, both at domestic level and at EU level, to deliver the supermajorities. And so it's in that sense, I meant, that it, 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 it leaves political space to the left and right where we see the emergence of the, uh, of, of the populace on both sides uh, of, the, uh, of the political spectrum. On, of course, the Euro crisis and the migration crisis, these were two crises that really exposed deep cleavages across the member states, and there wasn't an available compromise. The, in the case of the euro crisis, it was the cre creditor-debtor cleavage, and the costs of adjustment were, <coughs> was borne by, by the debtors, and on the migration crisis, obviously the southern European countries uh, that were most exposed to the flows of, uh, to the flows of people. But the, the point I was making about consensus was more to do with the stru structural features of the EU as a polity. I think we will come back to the, the question, is populism bad and, and why? And I'll take a few questions first because I think it will tie in with those other questions. Um, did, I have, did you have a question, Andrew, as well? Yes? And then I'll... Yeah. Uh, a quick question. I think for Bridget, well, I think for all the panel, really, and it's the relation of their discussion to broader trends in terms of the fragment, the territorial fragmentation of European politics as, a, as a, what seems to me an important underlying trend. Longer standing trends are perhaps partisan dealignment, so kind of fragmentation is territorial in terms of party alignments, and it seems to me in relation to Bridget's question that you could argue that the centre no longer holds. Uh, and so the EU as a, party, as, a, as a kind of centrist project will encounter difficulties when the centre seems to no longer hold in the way that it did traditionally because of these other trends. And perhaps also then an, uh, an issue I'd be interested in your reflection on is also levels of political trust, trust in institutions, trust in leaders, because as far as I'm aware, there's been quite a significant decline in overall levels of trust in institutions and leaders. And I'm wondering how that translates into the discussion of populism when there does seem to be quite a lot of anger in the wider public about uh, uh, political leaders and institutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question also from Gabor, I think, here. Thank you. I'm Gabor Holmey. I'm also a, a lawyer at the law department here at the EUI. So actually, uh, my question is probably to Brigitte, but mostly to Sasha. So, uh, I would like to, to, to talk only about East Central Europe, which was raised both by, by Bridget's presentation and Hans Peters uh, as well. So uh, in my view, uh, this phenomenon of, of East Central Europe, member states of East Central Europe, mostly Hungary and, and Poland, but uh, more, more and more Romania as well, Bulgaria, so, in my view, this, this has nothing to do with populism. Uh, indeed, it is, it is uh, uh, anti-constitutionalism, uh, but if we, we consider uh, populism as, 
anti-elitist, as, as we discussed. We consider as anti-systemic, as anti-system or anti-establishment, as Bridget uh, just, just mentioned. Uh, I guess that none of, none of those characteristics apply to, to East Central Europe. Uh, so therefore, I, I can list a lot of examples, starting with the constitution-making procedure in, in, in Hungary, or, or the, the, the regulation about referendum, uh, uh, increasing the threshold, making it impossible to, to, to use any kind of popular uh, uh, sovereign, sovereign tools. So in my view, this has really nothing to do with, with, with the reference to the, to the people. There is reference to the people as a rhetoric, but not, not as, as, as a goal. In other words, I, I would say that this is nothing else but authoritarian tendencies in, in those countries. Uh, and I, although I'm not an expert and I do not want to raise this issue, but I have the same feeling uh, with, with uh, some left-wing uh, uh, populist parties mentioned in Hans Peter's uh, presentation, Podemos or Syriza, has, has probably uh, nothing to do with, with for instance, uh, 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 anti-constitutional uh, uh, elements. So they are, they are not, not anti-constitutional. They are anti-elitist, they are, they are certainly anti-system, anti-establishment, but in that sense they are real populist, but they cannot be compared with, with those in, in East Central Europe. Thank you. There was also a question. Yes, there are many questions. Don't, I, I don't forget this side of the room, don't worry. Yes. Yes, please, yes. Thank you very much. Carlos Cruz from the School of International Governance. And I, I am afraid to have a very small methodological question from Hans Peter. And I, I really like it to be effort to be parsimonious in your explanations, but uh, I have a question that always troubles me when listening to this decomposition of regions within the European Union, which is the construction of this idea of Southern, Southern Europe. And I would like to hear what are the, the basis to construct such a macro region. Uh, as far as I understood from your presentation, you're arguing that the, the cleavage here is a, the cleavage provoked by the economic crisis. But if we're going to do really a, trying to assess the, 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 the impact of European governance on the, politicization, I think it would make sense to distinguish countries in which there was a direct intervention by the European Union, that would be Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and Greece, versus countries that did not have this intervention. And that raises a very interesting, a very interesting puzzle. We'll see in some of those countries, um, I would say Portugal, Spain, um, and Ireland, the politicization has been kind of circumstantial, it's not sustained through time, so you see now the discourses in Spain and Portugal and of course in Ireland, you wouldn't see that amount of politicization about the European Union. In Italy, nevertheless, you have uh, this amount of uh, politicization. And that's a very interesting paradox to be explained, right? Why governance, intervention by European Union governance in the macroeconomic crisis and management of macroeconomic policy has provoked a little bit of politicization in, can, in a certain countries, and nevertheless, in those countries, there hasn't been intervention. There is politicization, right? And that kind of breaks down the notion of, uh, of Southern Europe as a kind of uh, entity that is explained by the same kind of uh, factors. Thank you. Hi, my name is Massimiliano Santini. I'm a fellow with the School of Transnational Governance here at EUI. I have two questions for all <laughs> panelists. One is about political narrative. Um, in, in various ways, um, all the presentation look at the um, inherent uh, drivers or merits of the populist movement, of the rise of the populist movement. I was wondering how, what do the panelists think about instead the failure of the other political side, if we want to call them a liberal, democratic, progressive alternative, to put out there a, a, a political narrative that would be as successful 
as the populist <coughs> narrative has been. And secondly, I was wondering what is the, um, the multi what are the thoughts of the panelists about the um, idiosyncratic rise of the populist movement here in Italy, according to the latest um, survey, they poll now at over 60%. Thank you. The question is actually for Gabor, <laughs> so that he will then clarify the question that he would put to Hans Peter. Because you said that the, uh, you believe Syriza and Podemos are anti-systemic, but they are not anti-constitutional. So I wonder if you could elaborate what's the difference, uh, uh, because um, I assume that you're comparing, for example, with Hungary, but there you have a party in government, so you can have specific. And in Greece, it's the only of the two cases where you have. And I will argue that Syriza, if you look at what they did, for example, with the independent media authority, they've taken measures that if they would have had the opportunity, they would not behave very differently. Of course, they give the justification that they had to decapitate the independent media authority because it was dominated by the previous political elite, but that's the same thing that Orban does in, in, in Hungary. So just... Uh, Richard Rose, three comments mostly directed toward Bridget. Um, first of all, I think we need an additional word besides Eurorealism, which is Euroforica, which is Euro-unrealism, or which rewrites post-war European history. I did my doctoral thesis on 45-51, and I can't help but note that the guarantee of peace in Europe was 1949, the founding of NATO. In a funny way, the French rejection of German rearmament strengthened NATO, weakened Europe in 54, and also the Marshall Plan led to the Committee on European Economic Coordination which led to OECD. So there's always, and to claim that in the 21st century, when perhaps too many people take peace for granted, is to invoke the middle of the 20th century and get it wrong. But there's an assumption among what I call the, the Euro-Foracers, that it's just good, 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 by contrast with the Euro-Realists, who by definition will see limitations. The second point is that what you call limited scope on national politics would exist without the EU as well. Small states have always known this. Paul Henri Spock said two kinds of countries, those that are small and know it, and those that don't and the French response to German unification showed they realized what I call interdependence. The EU inserts something fresh to interdependence in the words of an Austrian central bank uh, general director, we're in the room when Germans are there. We can, the Irish can chair meetings. The Irish influence on Brexit is an extreme example of small states. So I think that juridical equality uh, gives small states a leverage, which is an important feature which many national uh, politicians or their state secretaries admit or are very vocal about in private. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question was it from Giancarlo or Sandra, I don't know. Giancarlo was first, I think. So, yeah. Thank you very much. It was extremely interesting. My questions are very simple and uh, also very quick. Uh, the first point is uh, the populist parties prevail, uh, prevail against the other parties. I mean, uh, Either uh, ra they are raising or even they are winning um, elections. So the question is, uh, uh, do you think that the European Union issue 
is one of the factor of the main factors that allow these populist parties to win or to raise. Or is a consequence. I mean, they win for other reason, and then they are also uh, uh, have uh, European Union as a target, uh, or they attack uh, the European Union. So, what uh, uh, I think that uh, we should understand is if the European Union is one factor that help, helps uh, the uh, populist party to raise and to win. And the second question. Uh, is uh, about the politicization of uh, uh, the integration. So I understand that this means that today uh, the integra European <laughs> integration is a political issue at the national level. But what it lacks is the other aspect, that uh, there is no concept of the European Union, like the arena, the forum, where the political debate, the political fighting can be held. And this is something that lack uh, even uh, in, uh, in the other uh, traditional parties. Um, it goes a bit in the similar direction, and I would like to direct it to um, Hans-Peter. Um, if we put uh, the chicken and egg question to the relationship between um, the electoral campaigns, the politicization of Europe, and the formation of new structuring conflicts in European societies, and I think here you, you also think of cleavages in the sense that Hogan, Marx, and on the basis of Stalin Rockan, have been thinking. So, um, what is the, 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 the causal relationship? Um, in, in which direction do you think that is it preponderant? Is the, um, or, or put different, how far, how far to the politicization uh, dynamics, the electoral campaigns, the, the, uh, the populism actually fuel the formation of these uh, new cleavages? Um, I think you were. Or, or maybe it's, it's both. You, you were not you know, fully clear on that because you said the, the cleavages have been taking shape before already um, in the 1980s. We have seen manifestations of that in, in North um, West Europe. Um, but, but you also spoke about the dynamics between um, the European regions and that in the end you sort of suggested that there might be an approximation between uh, Southern Europe and Northwestern Europe or is it only Italy? So, so how far does this politicization do these electoral campaigns, does populism actually contribute um, not only to the deepening of these uh, new cleavages, but also to their proliferation? My name is Graham Avery. I'm a visiting fellow at the um, Schumann Center here. I'm British and I worked for the European Commission in Brussels for 33 years. And one of the reasons I'm here this year is to escape Brexit. But even here, of course, that's not that's impossible. Although at least here the debate is, is more analytical than politicized. It's not for the first time today I've heard the remark that Brexit is a fascinating and extraordinary experiment. Anyway, I, I want to make a couple of comments about the British Brexit debate, which I don't think have been mentioned so far. Um, one is that in the United Kingdom, some of the important actors among the anti-European forces have included revolutionaries. And I'm not talking here about left-wing revolutionaries, but revolutionaries within the existing political system, and I'm talking about the Conservative Party. To name names, Michael Gove has always represented someone who wanted, who was in favor of creative destruction within the political system. And Dominic Cummings, who was adopted by Gove and then masterminded the Leave campaign, uh, publicly preaches. Uh, the most important thing is not just to regain control from Brussels, but to demolish the existing British political system. 
That was my first remark about Brexit. The second remark is that, of course, in the British context, the, the, the anti-Europeans made successful use of the referendum rather than traditional parliamentary elections, which is the normal way of proceeding in Britain. On that, I wonder if Hans-Peter Kriese, who, who, who comes from Switzerland and therefore knows a good deal about referendums, would you like to say something about the difference between the parliamentary systems and the plebiscite system when it comes to, to, um, to um, th th these questions of populism? M my last remark and question is to bridge it. I, I, I applaud the distinction, the distinction that she made between Eurosceptics and Europhobes. When I worked in Brussels, I always said, I am a skeptic. I mean, you have to examine and re-examine the official policies and, and the received wisdom. Uh, and I, and I, I used to use the word Europhobe uh, for, for most of the things that I encountered in Britain. Uh, my question to, to Bridget is, she also mentioned a third category of Euro-realists, and I wonder if she could um, uh, tell us a bit more about what that signifies. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take one more question, and then we need to have time for the panel to, to answer, of course. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, three points on the revolution issue. Um, Sir Ivan Rogers, who was the UK ambassador to the... Um, EU until he was forcibly removed um, in January 2017, gave a brilliant lecture last week in Cambridge called Brexit as a Revolution, and it's on Trinity website, I'm Trinity ready. College Cambridge, and it's mm. absolutely outstanding. It's had quite a lot of traction. On the specific issue um, about um, populists being the aberration, this is a fundamental problem because in fact, because they've been treated as aberrant and therefore need to be put in a box, it has meant that the issues haven't been addressed about what their real concerns are about the EU and about it being an elitist project. Which brings me to my, dare I say it, slightly tongue-in-cheek question. Given, Bridget, you said that European Parliament elections are seen as second order and, um, uh, and therefore an opportunity for protest votes, does that mean we should abolish the European Parliament? Very much. I think Gabor wanted to reply briefly to one of the comments made. Yeah, really, one sentence is an easy question to answer, I guess, because, as I said, uh, Orban and Kaczynski are not anti-establishment. They, they destroyed the, the current uh, 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 rule of law or, or, or democratic establishment, and they built up an, an anti-constitutional uh, establishment, while I do not see either Podemos or Syriza to, to have any pursuit to, to destroy constitutional uh, systems. The only uh, left-wing left -wing, uh, uh, populist party uh, in Europe, if we uh, uh, agree with Hans-Peter's uh, characterization, is Five Star. I do not see any, any attempt to, to destroy the, the constitutional system by, by, by Cinque Stelle. Give the floor to Hans-Peter. Yeah, I have a lot to say, so you stop me when you think uh, I take too long. First, the definition of populism. I, I, I want to say something about this because there is now a definition that is in, uh, in the circles who right on populism is, is becoming the dominant definition. It is close to what you said, but you extended it a bit too, lo too far. It is people-centrism, anti-elitism, and popular sovereignty. So uh, the populists want to restore popular sovereignty. This means that the populists, <coughs> at least as they perceive themselves, are democratic. They are not anti-system in the sense that they are anti-polity. They are anti-elite. They are against the specific elite that is now governing, but they are not anti-system. At least, as declared, they have, and I think that's very important, they have a vision of democracy which is a majoritarian vision 
writ large. So they give short shrift to the liberal element. You called it constitutional element. They, they have a certain disregard for the liberal element of democracy. So no checks and balances, no pluralism, because they know what to do and the people is one. So pluralism, deliberation, this is not necessary. And the connection between the people and the elite is, uh, let's say, reduced uh, because the leader, which is very often the, the, the person that personifies populist parties, speaks in the name of the people and knows what the people want. <coughs> Having said this, I think the moment they get into power, undivided, and that is very, very important. And in Eastern Europe, they get the power undivided. In Western Europe, they have to share the power with others. And if you are in coalition with others, you cannot implement your vision, your illiberal vision of democracy to the same extent as you can if you get power undivided. And in Latin America, for example, they get power undivided. And there, they become very dangerous. See Chavez and, and so forth. But I think, I, I wouldn't say these Eastern European cases entirely lack populist aspects. They, they, they become authoritarian, that's the most important thing, but they can implement their authoritarian vision because they get power undivided. Now, Sandra, the chicken egg, I was thinking of the same thing which you mentioned when I saw the title, but in my view, there are two distinct phenomena. On the one hand, there is social change, social structural change, which uh, is at the, at the source of this new cleavage which I was talking about. Populism has another source. Populism's source is the crisis of representation. It, it has specifically political sources. And, the, and then they are divided again. One is the non-responsiveness, what Catherine has mentioned, the, the non-responsiveness of the elites to the problems, concerns of, the, of some of the people. And, and that is especially the case in Northwestern Europe. Immigration, and I think it's immigration. Immigration is the key issue of uh, these guys on the right. Uh, on the left, it is uh, uh, much more uh, economic uh, and, and uh, social policy, which is important, but on the on the right, it's immigration, and European integration <laughs> is part and parcel of this. So, on the uh, it's non-responsiveness, and on the other hand, it's performance failure. In Southern Europe, it's a lot of performance failure. In Eastern Europe, it's performance failure. It's corruption. So everybody is against corruption, it's against the, the lack of state capacity, and, but it is also uh, intervention from outside. The, 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 the Tsipras, he talked about the national, the domestic troika, and the uh, European troika. He was against the domestic elite, but he was also against the European elite, who intervene and tell the, the Greeks what they have to do, so who destroy Greek democracy. I think normatively, these guys are all Democrats, and they think of themselves as better Democrats. Uh, and in that sense, they are not just a danger. They become a danger when they are in power uh, and get power undivided. As long as they mobilize, I think, someone has said they are a corrective for democracy. Because in Brexit vote, more people voted than in the general elections. So finally, people could express themselves. Uh, in, in Germany, with the uh, uh, coming up of the AfD, participation went up. Uh, so you, in, in the regional elections, but also in the national, national elections, people who have not voted before suddenly have an option and uh, they uh, are included in, in the democratic process. So it's... They are not just a danger, and I think we should, we should <coughs> not forget that on the one hand, they articulate 
substantive concerns which have uh, been neglected immigration, in, in immigration, but also in European integration. And, and Bridget, you say, Europe is the ideal other. Indeed, it is the ideal other because it's elitist, it's far removed, and, uh, and, and people have the impression that they don't have anything to say. But you, I think you are a bit uh, neglecting one point. It's also non-democratic. It's, it's not just lack of consensus-driven decision-making. It's, it's a centrist project, you say, but it is also a technocratic project, or it's perceived as, uh, which is very remote from the people and which is non-responsive to the concerns of the people. So the, the democratic deficit, I think, is one of the drivers that uh, uh, drives uh, these, these populists. But uh, to come back to, to, to the chicken and egg, so you have the structural causes, but you have also the political causes, and they reciprocally reinforce each other. So I think chicken and egg is not a good image because it's two separate phenomena which come together uh, and which in, in, in different circumstances get combined in different ways. Now, th th there were other things. Yeah, uh, Masi, you, you ask a very important question. We talk about the rise of the ones, but not a, about the failure of the others. Because the, the rise of the ones is made possible by the failure of the others. And my answer I have just given, it's, it's a crisis of representation. The others did not take into account the concerns, the mainstream parties did not take into account the concerns of, of the people who care about or have, are afraid of immigration, and they did not uh, take into account the, the concerns of the nationalists uh, when they built Europe. European integration by stealth, they, uh, I mean, the post-functionalists have addressed this. Finally, about the parliamentary versus the referendum system and its relation to populism, I think, uh, <coughs> The problem of the use uh, of the referendum in parliamentary systems is that they are used at the discretion of the elite. So the, the leaders call at their discretion referenda. In a system like Switzerland, the referenda are either constitutionally prescribed or they are called from the bottom. So uh, the, the government cannot call a referendum in a system like the Swiss one. And that is very much different. So you, you cannot uh, uh, use the, 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 as a government, you cannot use the referendum as you please. And, and that m gives it a much more uh, much less dangerous aspect, I think, because it's in fully institutionalized in the practice of the system. Yeah, shortly. Ah, I forgot, I forgot, sorry. Yes, I, let me answer this question about Southern Europe too. M microphone. Yes, uh, you say, actually it's Italy where uh, Europe was most politicized and Italy did not suffer from intervention. So it was most politicized in Greece, by far. So the, the destruction of the Greek party system has everything to do with the memorandum and the bailout. So that uh, granted, uh, what is the matter with Italy? On the one hand, I would say Italy had implicit conditionality. You remember there was Draghi uh, writing a letter to, or was it Trisce still, uh, writing a letter to Berlusconi that now he should uh, get his act together. So uh, it, it was not uh, the same intervention as in the other countries, but it was a, a pretty, pretty visible intervention. And then secondly, I would say the refugee crisis was 
is for Italy, for the case of Italy, much more important than the Euro crisis. So the rise of, of Salvini in particular uh, has a lot to do with the refugee crisis, whereas the rise of Cinque Stelle is a totally national domestic phenomenon which has nothing to do with Europe. I, I, I would say the Euro crisis in Italy did not mobilize so much as the refugee crisis. Yeah, shortly. Mm. Sasha, you're right the, on questioning whether, why we can consider that populist parties are bad, because finally they're expressing ideas, and you're true to underline the fact that uh, they're harming constitutional democracies and maybe also European values. Uh, but then it's quite interesting to see that we are speaking about smart people. On the first point, they will always claim that they're looking for efficiency. And if you look at why people are voting for those guys, it's about efficiency. There are a very frightening public opinion poll going on that has been done for the last 20 years, asking people, do you consider that there is another political system which is preferable to democracy? I get that the level of answer for yes is 48% among young people in the USA. So nearly half of young people think that there is another political system which is, more, which is preferable to, to democracy. There's been another public opinion poll that's very, very funny in an funny, in a Italian newspaper asking to, to, uh, to citizens voting for the various party, who is your favorite foreign leader? For the Lega, it's Putin and Trump. For, uh, for Cinque Terre, it's Putin. For Forza Italia, it's Putin and Trump. So there is really that fascination for authoritarian leaders uh, and then a, a possibility for, for, for populist party to say we're just giving people what they expect. They don't care about the court. They, they just want efficient efficiency. And then on values, if you listen to those leaders, they never say that they don't like value or something. They just have their own values. And it's quite interesting to see, and next European election will be about that. Which values? The values from Brussels, all the values that are maybe more traditional, attached to family, to the nation, etc., etc. And, and if you listen to someone like Orban, he's speaking a lot about values, but his own definition of values, and here uh, there is a conflict, and then again, it's very difficult. Um, Giancarlo, about uh, did the EU help European um, Eurosceptic Party to grow? Yes, for sure. It was a niche for them. It was a dream, and they have used it as much as, as possible. EU incarnated everything that anti-establishment establishment, uh, person don't like, uh, centralization and expert and non-responsibility and whatever. And it's also a very passive target. You can say anything you want on the EU. Nobody will ever contradict you because nobody is speaking on behalf of the EU. Um, also, the EU has provided a lot of means to those. Bridget has, has mentioned that. Uh, it's the first place where uh, uh, those populist people were able to get elected. And still today, in some countries, it's very difficult for those parties to get elected. The Front National has one third of the French seat in the European Parliament. They only have two of the 577 in, in the National Assembly. So it's also a matter of voting rule that helped them uh, to, to, um, to, to get elected and then to get the mean and the parliamentary assistant and then the status of European political parties and the funding. And finally, if we look at the last sequence, it provided them with a legitimation. People like Tsipras get, get, gained a lot of legitimation in, in European instance, saying that I can govern at home because I was big at European level. And, and just finally, uh, uh, on a note, uh, I think that the world discussion has been quite depressive about uh, that rise of Euroscepticism, and there are still positive things to underline here. I would see four things. Uh, first of all, Euroscepticism has helped to re-inject politics in, in a depoliticized uh, polity. And this is something which is nice. We need that in terms of legitimation. We need that in showing that the EU is a place for contradiction and debate. And uh, it also created, as mentioned by Hans Peter, responsiveness on the side of EU leaders and national leaders. So maybe we are on the way, way of fixing that. Second, the EU has become a central dimension of public debate at national level, and that was needed as well. Otherwise, people just have the feeling that something is happening in Brussels. Nobody ever discussed about that, and it has a huge impact on, on national level. Third, we also witness grassroots social mobilization against uh, core EU policies. And so that's a form of normalization of EU policy. So today, maybe it's for the worse, only in the, in the direction for contesting, but it could lead to some more constructive and positive discussion around key EU policies in the future. 
And finally, my last point would be uh, about the fact that um, uh, uh, the European issues has allowed some parties to, tra to, to challenge the traditional parties and in a way has in a, this created a disrupting effect in, in the political structure uh, of most uh, member states. It can be for the worse with Eurosceptic parties, but it can go the other side. Because if you look, for instance, the election of Macron, it was exactly the same. He was bringing an answer to some Euro concerns about uh, European affairs. He was the only candidate speaking for the, the EU and addressing in a quite, let's say, courageous way that issue, uh, whether the center-left and center-right parties in France, nobody wanted to speak anymore about the EU, and it worked. So it's also possible to challenge the existing political system on EU affairs in a positive way, like Macron or maybe Sanchez in, in Spain, and maybe we'll have other cases in the future. Thank you for this uh, positive note. And now, Bridget, we're going slightly over time. So I'll be, uh, I, I, I realize I stand between you and coffee, so I won't. Uh, just a number of points. I think, Andrew, uh, what, your identification of the deeper <coughs> trends in politics today is very important. But the geography of discontent, political parties are not what they once were. And the trust issue relates to the crisis of representation that uh, Hans Peter identified. On East Central Europe, that was really uh, interesting what you said that, although I think, I think that there is an appeal to some of the populist tropes are being used by the, the people and we're the authentic, uh, authentic people. For me, the interesting question about East Central Europe, and it's not just Hungary and Poland now, is why a defensive nationalism emerged that was really authoritarian in characteristic. Was that because of the democratic tradition and the absence, the weakness of the uh, constitutionalism and state institutions, the weak structuring of society, easy capture, elite easy capture, and that's the question uh, that I have uh, for you. On um, political narratives and why, uh, you know, can, the liberal, can there be a lib liberal democratic alternative, a progressive alternative? I think narrative matters, but I don't think narrative cuts it because there are also really deep issues there that, are, that political systems in Europe have got to respond to. So I don't think narrative, I think narrative matters, but narrative is not a solution if that's what, if that's what the question uh, implied. There actually has to be real policy uh, and political responses for the reasons that uh, Hans Peter mentioned. Richard, on uh, the identification of geopolitics and the particular geopolitical environment that the EU grew up in, I think that's absolutely central to the development of, of the EU. But of course, we now live in a geopolitical world of shift and shock. That world is cracking. I mean, that or the the international liberal order is cracking. Uh, the United States has uh, is is not the leader it wants, and you have all the development of the other great powers. So again, Europe in the 21st century finds itself in a very difficult <coughs> geopolitical environment. On your point on small states, absolutely. But I think that, in other words, that states would. There are limits to what states can do. Of course there are. There are limits to the sovereignty and autonomy of all states, and there always has been. But there are specific features of the EU that limit what can be done in public policy. I absolutely take what you say on, on small states. We shouldn't forget there are 22 small states in the EU. It is a, a 19th century small state nationalist if they could have dreamt of a system that was good for small states, they would have, they would have been very happy if someone said at the European Union. And I always remind everyone about Lloyd George at Versailles when he turned around and said to uh, his, his, his aide, he said, my man, are we giving upper or lower Silesia away today? You don't give countries away in Europe any, anymore. So that I, I absolutely buy the small, uh, the small state argument. Uh, then, just very briefly on Euro realists. So, if parties that have tend, tended to oppose the EU and quite Eurosceptic and Eurocritical, if they want office, 
they tend to move towards a more, they retain a critical perspective, that, but they don't oppose in quite the way they did, because if you go into power, then it means you also have to uh, go to Brussels and you have to engage with, with what, what happens there. And on the, uh, should the European Parliament be <coughs> abolished? Absolutely not. I think it is remarkable that there are transnational elections, albeit with national colours in Europe. But I, do, I, I would say a number of things about the European Parliament. I think it remains disgraceful that we do not have public access to the expenses of MEPs. I think that if we're talking about trust, if we're talking, I mean, I think it's disgraceful and I think it should, it, it, it should stop. And <coughs> equally, the parliament itself needs to move much more quickly when its rules are being broken on the financing side. And I don't mean just by the populist parties. All parties regard the European Parliament as a means of adding to their power resources, to their to their public heft at domestic level. And so I think the parliament needs to be much more stringent in the way public money is used and for what, and for what purposes. But of course, that means taking on the bureau of the presidents and vice presidents, and they have an incentive to maintain the system uh, as is. So abolish the European parliament, absolutely not. Uh, but I think, uh, like any parliament, its house must be in order, and that's not necessarily the case. So thank you very much to all the panelists for excellent presentations and also for the, the excellent questions. I think it will provide food for thought for the rest of the day, and I won't stand between you and tea and coffee. So thank you very much. <laughs>